Um, okay, um, let me just kick it off. Um, well, everybody, uh, good afternoon and thanks for joining us today. This is our first ever faculty candidate talk via video. Uh, so all of us are curious how this goes, uh, including I'm guessing our speaker. But either way, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Ran Ben Basat. Um, he is a postdoc at Harvard University. And before that, he got his, um, I believe, bachelor's, master's, and PhD all at Technion. And at Harvard, he's been working with Michael Mitzenmarker and Milan Yu. Over the last year, um, he's done a lot of good work, very prolific as a researcher who's published across uh, top tier venues across networking, databases, uh, as well as theory. So, um, so I'm kind of curious what he's going to tell us about uh, today. And the title of his talk is uh, Leveraging Programmable Switches for In-Network Computing. And I'll, I'll let him take it on from here. OK, uh, so thanks, Otur, for the introduction. Thanks to you all for uh, joining. Um, I'll be talking about how to leverage a new type of switches that have a new programmable uh, capability to do uh, in-network computing. And the motivation for this work really comes from a few trends that are now going on. And the first of which, which I'm sure I don't have to tell you about, is that we live in the big data era. Right? So we send more emails, watch more videos, high definition videos, and so on. And we want to make more out of the data. So we want to answer more complex and diverse queries. Like for example, if we are some e-commerce website, uh, we may want to um, recommend uh, products for our users. We want to analyze large social networks and in the case of networking, uh, we want to collect very fine-grained network telemetry so we would know everything that's going on in the network. Maybe this would allow us to fulfill this vision of having uh, self-driving networks that can diagnose problems themselves and fix them. And we also want the queries to be answered in real time. And this is very important, for example, in uh, security, if we want to figure out whether a package should go to an intrusion prevention system, we cannot buffer it for too long uh, while making the decision. If we're thinking of uh, search, then if a user searches for insurance, we really need uh, to decide on the ads to show him uh, quickly. And if we think of uh, self-driving cars and we don't get uh, the uh, query result at real time, well, this is what could happen, right? Um, so while all of this is going on, we are nearing the end of the software approach. And what I mean by that is that the performance of CPUs is not scaling as fast as the data is. We're actually falling behind Moore's law for the last two decades or so. And according to the chairman of the organization that roadmap these advances, we are pretty close to the limit where we'll no longer be able to boost the uh, CPU performance a lot. And instead, uh, what we see in recent years is this new trend of uh, specialized hardware. I'm sure you are all aware of uh, GPUs and uh, FPGAs. And uh, today I'm going to talk about another type of hardware that is programmable switches. So these are hardware switches. And like uh, traditional switches, they're really highly optimized for uh, latency and throughput. Uh, but we now have some programmability that uh, we can leverage, um, as I will show you today. So we talked about three trends. We talked about how the data is growing. We talked about how we want to answer complex queries and how we want the answers in real time. Uh, well, this pose uh, some challenges. So for example, while the data is growing, the amount of um, fast memory that we have, so if we want to access the memory for each data element that we process, we really need to use fast memory. And the sizes of fast memory are still quite small. So there are many orders of magnitude difference between the data scale and the amount of fast memory that we have. We want to answer complex queries, um, but all these different hardware uh, targets have limited programmability. So they are nothing like CPUs that are much harder to work with. And this makes our life difficult when we want to implement queries. Uh, and for real time, this basically means that each data element that comes in, we really need to process it um, real fast. So let me explain the challenges uh, a bit deeper. So our thinking of limited memory, then the memory that we have on the programmable switches that we can access, for example, for each packet, is even today still in tens of megabytes. And this is in a sharp contrast to the data scale, the amount of uh, traffic going through a switch. If we think about the programmability, so all of these hardware targets are designed for some specific domain, like uh, switches are great at uh, moving data around and uh, routing packets. 
uh, but they also come with domain specific limitations. And in the case of switches, uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. We cannot make too many operations on each packet and we cannot even do um, things like multiplication, let alone other uh, more expensive operations. And the reason for both of these is we want to bound the latency. We cannot have high latency for the packet, so we cannot do too many things uh, on each packet. The third challenge, uh, if we think about processing packets and maybe collecting network telemetry and figuring out what's going on in the network, well, we now have much faster networks than we used to have 20 years ago, and this is to support this growth of data. Right? So we have 400 times faster networks, uh, but at the same time, the size of packets, like the units of information that we send over the network, is roughly the same as it were. So now we have a lot more packets uh, going on, and we, this means that the amount of time we can spend processing each goes down um, accordingly. So in today's talk, I'm going to uh, present two projects uh, that I've been doing in my postdoc at Harvard. I'm going to talk about Pint, and Pint is our uh, telemetry collecting uh, system. And telemetry is about figuring out what's going on in the network, and I'll explain what I mean by that when we get there. And the way people are usually using uh, network telemetry is that they somehow collect this information from the network, and then they send it to processing in database system uh, like uh, Apache Spark. And this brings me to the uh, other project, uh, which is Cheetah. And Cheetah is a way to accelerate um, database uh, operations. So we can now have an end-to-end -end approach where we collect information using Pint and then process the results using Cheetah. Let me tell you a bit about myself. Um, so I'm looking at system problems. I'm trying to formulate uh, frameworks and abstractions that uh, would help us design algorithms to solve them. Uh, once we have these, I try to design algorithms that have the system constraints in mind, for example, the constraints of the um, programmable switch. And what is really important to me in all of the projects I'm doing is I want the uh, solutions to be formally analyzed. I want to uh, have some performance guarantees. And let me explain what I mean by that uh, for these two um, projects. So in Cheetah, our goal is to accelerate databases. And the new abstraction we came up with uh, is that the data would go through a switch. And then if the switch can figure out that some part of the input is not going to affect the output of the query, uh, then the switch can discard this part of the data. Um, and therefore, we will have fewer entries to process in software, and we can get a speed up. So uh, designing algorithms in Cheetah is all about uh, trying to figure out on the switch what part of the data we can remove. Uh, the way we address the challenges in Cheetah uh, is that if the switch cannot um, complete an entire query uh, on its data plane because of its limitations, then we can offload part of the data a part of the query to the switch. And the idea is that if I can uh, significantly accelerate part of the data, this can still give me a lot of uh, acceleration overall. And for uh, the provable performance guarantees in Cheetah, what this means is that we can analyze and uh, bound the expected amount of pruning or data reduction in the switch that we can do. And this uh, directly applies to the amount of acceleration that we can get. For Pint, uh, the goal is to collect network telemetry. And the problem of, of collecting network telemetry is that now we have this data. It's spread in the network. It's across the different switches. And we want to encode it somehow onto multiple packets. So this is like uh, distributed in both terms of uh, the number of encoders and the number of packets. And we still want to somehow encode this information so that when we collect the packets, we will figure out what's going on in the entire network. The way we address the challenges in Pint are different. Uh, so if one switch cannot analyze everything that's going on in the network, then we can leverage multiple switches for that. Uh, we have uh, more than one switch in the network. And uh, the provable performance guarantees for Pint is really about uh, the time we need to collect the information or how many packets we need before I can read out the network state. Both of these projects are programming P4. They are designed for uh, programmable switches. And I'm going to start uh, with Cheetah. Uh, and Cheetah is about accelerating uh, databases. So databases are everywhere. Alibaba are now running over 8 billion data qu uh, database queries a day. And since there's so much uh, money and interest 
in these uh, systems. Uh, they're really highly optimized for performance. We have multiple um, different database systems. And in Cheetah, we chose to work with uh, Apache Spark. I think they are all have roughly the same uh, performance. So this is the state of the art, but Apache Spark is uh, open source. So we were able to uh, change it and benchmark the results. And this is a uh, joint work with uh, others from Harvard. So let me start uh, by giving you some uh, overview of uh, how Spark works. Uh, and it all starts when a user sends a query. The first stage is something that's called a query planner. And the idea is that there can be many different algorithms that run the same query. And the goal of the query planner is to come up with the best execution plan um, that would minimize the completion time. And everything from now on is going to be an example because there are different ways of how uh, Spark processes queries. But in this typical way, uh, we have one special node that's called the master node, and we have a bunch of worker nodes. And the idea is that the data is going to start at the worker nodes. This is how we're going to parallelize the processing um, between the different workers. And the workers are going to run some function that's called a UDF, or user defined function. This is how they process the data. And then they send the processed data to the master node. The master node aggregates the data and gives the result back to the user. Uh, let me give you an example. Let's say that uh, we're Amazon or something. We have a huge table of uh, products. Each product have a seller. Um, maybe some sellers have multiple products. And we want to compute, let's say, the set of distinct sellers in this uh, table. So the UDF here uh, can basically remove the duplicates from each worker part of the data. Um, but still, some sellers may, be, uh, may have product on uh, different workers, so the master node would still need to aggregate the result by removing the duplicates that are across the different workers. So in Spark, uh, we have a switch. Uh, it routes packets between uh, the master and worker node, but it is passive. It doesn't take part in the computation, and this is what we're going to change in Cheetah. Uh, but the way we started this project was to analyze where Spark spends most of its time. And in our experiment, we saw that Spark mainly has two bottlenecks. Uh, one is this UDF, this uh, local computation that we run on the workers. Um, and the other is the master node. So when we want to aggregate the result, if this is a complex query, this can also take a while. So the idea in Cheetah is that if we can add some computation to the switch, this would helpfully help us uh, reduce the amount of computation we do in software on both the workers and master. So this is a breakdown of the time spent by Spark uh, for different uh, queries. Um, and what we see is that almost all of the time in Spark is going for computation. So specifically, this means that if I, let's say I have a 10 times faster network, I, it wouldn't help me a lot. I, I, the only way to significantly accelerate Spark is by handling um, this uh, computation bottleneck. So this is what we do in Cheetah. And like I mentioned, uh, running an entire query in Cheetah is quite complex. We are not sure that it's possible. So we came up with what we call uh, the pruning abstraction. And the idea is that uh, the switch can remove some of the data. It can prune some of the data. Uh, but what we want to guarantee is that if we run the query on the unpruned part of the data, the part that we haven't removed, this should give us the same output. Hey, hey, so hey, it, hey, yes. Can I ask a quick question just for context? Uh, since since you're talking about like kind of almost real time data, why 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 start with Spark and not like a time series database of some sort? So why did we choose to work with uh, Spark? Uh, I think what we saw that there are a lot of uh, interest in SQL operations, and we worked with uh, Spark SQL, which is one of the uh, main ways that people are running SQL queries uh, today. I meant like why not work with something that's optimized for time series or streaming uh, data um, as opposed to you know Spark, which is not really a time series um, analytics engine. It is not. So the way we think of Cheetah is that this is a hardware accelerator for database operations, right? So people are now running database operations um, either completely in software or accelerating them. Uh, using FPGAs and other alternatives, and we want to show that uh, offloading to the switch actually makes more sense. Um, does this answer your question? Um, yes, um, I was going back maybe to your example of like a stream of packets coming in from the network, and your goal is to process that. 
Mm -hmm. uh, I was connecting your choice of Spark to that that motivation. Uh, I think that's where I'm having a little bit of a semantic gap. Uh, but if your goal is to just you know take Spark and make it faster, that's like a different motivation angle, and which is also valid. Um, so in Cheetah, our goal was to accelerate uh, database operations. The, what I mentioned earlier about uh, collecting telemetry, this is the second part of the talk. This is fine. I'm going to get to that later. Uh, okay. Good. Thanks. Um, okay. So let me give you an overview of how Cheetah works. Right. So now uh, the query planner sends the plan to all of the parts involved, including the switch. And now Spark thinks it's going to send data from the workers to the master. But what's going to happen is that the data is going to go through a module we call the Cheetah Worker, which formats the data into packets in a way that the switch can read. The switch then runs some algorithm to decide what parts to prune, which entries to prune, and which to send to the master. And then we reformat the unpruned data into the way Spark likes it. So this entire execution is transparent to Spark. So the Spark master thinks he got all of the data from the worker. Uh, but since we are able to remove many of the entries at the switch, we can get a speed up. OK, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you an overview of how the switch works, of, of uh, popular uh, switching architecture. And then uh, it will allow us to understand how we run algorithms on the switch. And that would be uh, the next step. So um, I'm going to tell you a bit about uh, the PISA architecture. And the, the way it works is that when the packet gets to the switch, the first part is what's called the programmable parser. And the idea is that um, it allows us to specify what uh, fields in the packet we care about for processing. For example, it can be the source destination and protocol if you want to uh, check an access control list to see if it is permitted to go there. And what the parser is doing is it extracts the value of these fields and put them into something that's called a packet header vector. And now this vector is going to go through a pipeline. Um, and the idea is that in each stage of the pipeline, we can do some computation on these values. Um, but what's important here is that the pipeline is one directional. So once we're done with some stage, uh, we cannot go back to it. And once we're done with the last stage, uh, the packet's going to go up. The switch also has memory. Uh, it is partitioned in this, between the different pipeline stages. Uh, so this was done for performance, but this is also very limiting. So uh, if you think of it, if, when we're on the first stage, we cannot access, we cannot read from the memory of the second stage. And when we get to the second stage, uh, we cannot write back to the memory of the first stage. So every time we can only touch the memory that is uh, attached to this uh, stage. So this way, the uh, vector goes all the way uh, all, through all the stages. And then we end up with some modified vector. So maybe we added, changed, or uh, removed some of the fields. And the last step is uh, a deep parser, which takes this modified vector together with the original packet and decide how to modify it before sending it out. So why is it challenging to run algorithms on a PISA switch? Um, we have a several limitations. And the first is that we don't have a lot of pipeline stages. And the idea is that we want to bound the latency of the switch. So we cannot add too many of these stages. A second limitation is that uh, if we want to access this memory for each packet, then we really need to use a high speed memory. And it is quite small. So we have a limited amount of memory on each stage. A third limitation is that we can only support basic arithmetic operation because we want to uh, bound the latency of each stage. And the last limitation we're going to care about today is that we can only touch one memory address per stage. So we can do some computation that involves memory address one, but we cannot also touch memory address two for the same packet on the same stage. So there are, different, there are other limitations as well, but these are going to be enough to understand uh, the algorithms we designed for Cheetah. And I'm going to give you a first example of this uh, distinct query. So let's say I want to compute the set of distinct setters um, in our uh, table. And one intuitive way of doing that is if the switch can somehow encode the set of setters we've seen before, uh, so if a, a second comes for a second time, we can prune it at the switch, and this wouldn't affect the output. Um, but in order to meet the uh, 
memory limitation, we need to encode this set efficiently somehow. And one intuitive way of doing that is to use a Bloom filter, right? So a Bloom filter is a way uh, to encode a set using limited amount of memory. Um, but it turns out that in this example, Bloom filters are not a great solution. And the reason for that is that Bloom filters have false positives. And what this means is that we may get a seller that we've never seen before, but the Bloom filter will tell us this is a hit. And this means that if we're going to prune this, seller, this packet based on uh, the Bloom filter, uh, we will not be able to get the right output for the query. So we need some data structure uh, with no false positives. And a cache can do that, right? So the idea is that uh, we can store uh, some, uh, some items in the cache. And then if a seller comes in for the second time and it is in the cache, we can prune the packet. Otherwise, we can add it to the cache, but we have to forward the packet to the master. And to address the constraints that we can only touch one memory location, uh, we can actually only put one uh, entry per stage. And since we don't have a lot of stages, this is still not a great solution. So this would give us a very small cache. Uh, we will not get high heat rate. We will not be able to prune a lot of the entries and we will not get significant speed up from this approach. So the way we um, scale up this solution and uh, prune a lot more is using something I call a multi-row LIU cache. And the idea is that we're going to have uh, many small caches. And the way we uh, set the memory layout uh, for the algorithm is I'm going to keep the first entry of each cache on the first stage, the second memory on the, se the second entry on the second stage and so on. And the idea is that each packet now would only go into one of the rows uh, and this is how we can uh, touch just one memory location per stage. So it took something like this. Uh, we're going to use a hash function to map the current entry to one of the rows. So maybe set a one goes to row number two. Uh, if we don't see it in the cache, we cache it, but we have to forward the packet. Maybe set a two goes to row number one. And now if uh, the second seller comes again, uh, since this is a hash function, it's going to be mapped to the same cache. And if we can find it in the cache, then this allows us to prune the packet without sending it to the master. And the idea is that even though like uh, the size of each cache is small, like uh, maybe 10 items or uh, the number of stages we have on the switch, which is usually uh, tens of stages, uh, the overall cache size is decent because we have a lot of these small caches. This is how we can remove almost all of the duplicates in the data and get um, a significant speed up. Let me give you a second example. Let's say that I want to find the 100 most expensive products, right? Um, then one intuitive idea is that maybe we can somehow uh, keep track of what was the 100 most expensive product so far and prune any uh, value that is smaller than that, right? So we can actually implement something like this. We can put the largest number we've seen so far on the first stage, the second largest on the second stage and so on. And this works if n is small enough, but because we have a small number of stages, this wouldn't work if n is 100 or 1000, right? So we need somehow to limit the amount of comparisons we make per packet because we can only add, touch one memory address per stage. So what we do here kind of looks like the previous slide. We have multiple uh, of these rolling minimum uh, type of ideas, uh, like uh, each row is, would be a rolling minimum. And now we're going to prune a packet. We're going to discard an entry if it is smaller than all of the entries in its row. So this is a randomized algorithm, right? So I'm saying something like I want to find top 100 and I'm going to uh, prune this packet. I'm going to remove this value because it is smaller than 10 other values. So there's going to be some chance of this failing. But if the user tells me what n is, and we have some user-defined uh, success probability, let's say 99 for 99%, uh, we can tune this algorithm to solve the problems that is that probability. And what I mean by that is we can set the uh, correct number of rows and columns. And more than that, it turns out that there's a unique configuration for this algorithm that allows us to solve the problem while maximizing the expected pruning rate or 
how much data we can remove and therefore the, um, the maximal speed. So this is what the breakdown for Cheetah looks like, right? So we successfully removed the computation as a bottleneck. We now do a lot less computation in software. Um, but we now introduced a different bottleneck, which is the network. And the reason for that is we wanted to reduce the amount of computation done to workers. So the workers are now um, either not doing any computation or doing a more lightweight computation. And this means that they're sending a lot more data over the network. So this is why we have a lot more time uh, being spent on the networking side. Uh, and then most of the data gets pruned at the switch and the master completes the execution. And this is like uh, the computation part that you see at the bottom. Sorry, so, let me, uh, question. Yeah. Uh, do I have a question about this particular graph? So yeah. presumably the other alternative would have been to do these kind of filtering mechanisms on the, on the, on the end host, because presumably the group by would have actually also worked at that, at that, yeah. like it, what is it, is the, um, is it the case that, uh, all of these, uh, entries that are being dropped uh, are would actually be sent to the same uh, server or would they be distributed to multiple servers and that's the reason you wouldn't be able to eliminate them in just in software mm -hmm. so the advantage of doing this at the switch rather than on the servers is that the switch can see all of the data uh, as long as this is like a maybe rec scale deployment right so as long as you don't have um, multiple uh, masters and the data is going through multiple switches, the switch can see all of the data. And even in one rack, you can still um, do this on a pretty large scale. Um, and what we show is that this allows us for a better speed up than if, for example, you would use uh, an FPGA or a smart need to run on uh, each server alone, right? And the reason for this is again, that. The advantage for the switch is that it can see all of the data as opposed to uh, running something locally. Sure. So just to follow up a little bit on that, so um, mm -hmm. so the so the model that you're operating on is that is that the actual data is going to be spread over multiple servers. Yeah. Um, and uh, by having a single location or or a few locations to distinguish where the data is, you know, to like filter through the data, then that gives you some some advantage that m might be true. The, the follow up question, it's more of a methodological question. So, um, you you started by assuming that, uh, uh, and there are some questions actually posed on the on the on the chat room, and uh, I think uh, we should probably take them next after this. But um, it's the methodological question I'm after is is this assumption that 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 the right thing to build in in switches is RMT hardware. And one could imagine, for example, building a, a cache directly into the RMT hardware or building some kind of you know other matching mechanism or top, top 100, whatever they, those would be. I don't know if you have some insight as to why RMT is the right thing for us to assume for what switches have, or it's just what we have today, so therefore that's what we're gonna the, what we should try, what we're, what we're, what we need to explore using, uh, as opposed to what, you know, what we might have in the future. So I'm going to get to that towards the end of the talk, but you're right that in this project, we basically took an uh, RMT switch out of the box and worked around these constraints, uh, to try and make something useful. Um, but you're absolutely right that, uh, for different types of switches, the result can be different. And I think like, uh, we should try to influence the way that the switches are built so that they would be better in our applications, maybe, for example, in accelerating databases. Okay, so since you're gonna talk about it later, I'll, I'll just leave it there. Um, okay. Anyway, I think it's um, uh, Magda or Dan, did you wanna take, take and ask your question? Uh, sure, so I have a, uh, actually have a couple of questions. Uh, one clarifying question. So in the experiments that you're showing on the slide, uh, are the workers, did you actually try to compare against the query where the distinct or the group by is pushed to the workers so that each worker can locally run a distinct or can locally run a group by? This is and what only uh, send... we show for Spark. This is uh, how Spark is. So in this query you're doing already, so Spark here is doing the group by locally and then sending uh, the intermediate the results. 
to the month. Yes. I see. So probably the most of the benefit is that instead of doing the group buys in the workers, you're doing them in the switches. Yes. So we are doing it in the switch, and this is like we don't do it in software, and this is why we get a speed. Up. Okay. So this is interesting. The other question. Oh, okay. So I, I'm still confused on the on the high bar on the left. Is there a group I push down to the worker? Sorry. On the 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 gray gray bar on the left, the very tall bar. Yes. Does it have Does it have a distinct push down uh, into the workers, or yes. the workers? It does. So then I'm the distinct query, the way Spark executes it, is that each worker would compute the set of uh, distinct keys and each part of the data, and then send just these over the network. So, so once a, a workers themselves have eliminated duplicate then the amount of redundancy that you are left with is at most the number of workers. True. Uh, can you tell us how many workers did you have here? So I think this was done for five workers. So it means that the network essentially removed, uh, uh, reduced the size of the data by a factor of five. Uh, yes, but we also reduce uh, the computation at the worker because you don't need to compute the set of distinct keys at the worker. So what we do in Cheetah is we send all of the data um, without any computation, and then the switch prints most of it. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, so what else do we have in the paper? Uh, yeah. Magda, did you want to ask your other questions? Oh, uh, sure. So I can. I have one maybe quick question for clarification, and one question that I'm going to hold on to the end. Uh, okay. So the quick clarification is: in this setup, are you assuming that the cluster is executing one query at the same time? Like, what if I have many users running queries all at the same time? Do they share the switch, or is there some other uh, approach? So our assumption here for now is that we have uh, one query at the same time. We discuss an extension of that in the paper, but this is not what I'm showing right now. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, so what else do we have in the paper? We have uh, algorithms for all of the popular scale operations. We saw uh, consistent speed ups in all of them. And we have a new networking protocol. And the reason why we needed that is that uh, Spark runs over TCP, which is a protocol in which um, if the master doesn't acknowledge that it received some packet, then the workers would transmit it. And this would be a disaster that switch uh, prunes entry. So we have a new networking protocol that allows us to prune entries at the switch without the transmission, uh, while still ensuring the liability of the packet losses. We have provable performance guarantees, and this means that for a randomized algorithm, the user can give us a, a desired success probability. We analyze the expected pruning rate of the different queries, and we also have support for uh, compound queries or um, queries that people actually care about because uh, actual database queries are not as nice as the ones I just showed you. So this is a one uh, query from a benchmark that we are working with. And if you see here, we have a couple of joins together with a like, group by a top end, some filtering and some other operation. And this is just one query, right? So this is what we want to end up accelerating using Cheetah. And for accelerating something like this in Cheetah, it's all about finding uh, what path to offload uh, to the switch. And what we did for this specific query is to offload the join because this is uh, the most expensive part of the query. But I think that in the future, this should all be a part of the query planner. So the query planner should take the query and automatically decide what to put on the switch and what should the workers do. Okay. Um, so are there any questions in the chat that I should be aware of? Or? Yeah, there was a the question from one of the audience members, like I think just to try to understand the semantics of top end, is that exact or approximate? That is exact. So pruning for top end basically means I have to uh, guarantee with the desired probability that all of the top end are getting to the master. Uh, but if I want top 100, it's okay if I send 200 and the one top 100 will be among them so that the master can figure this out. Got it. Okay. Okay. Uh, so now I'm going to move to the second project, which is telemetry, and I'm going to start by giving you uh, some use cases. So I think like, probably not all of you are familiar with telemetry. And the first is congestion control. So uh, like in the road, if you have too many cars at the same time, it's going to take more time to get to the destination. 
And it's the same in networking. So congestion control is about figuring out uh, how to uh, tune the sending rate of each connection so that we don't cause congestion somewhere and possibly packet drops or high latency. And it turns out that unlike traditional congestion control mechanisms, the state of the art for congestion control is actually uh, using telemetry to collect uh, latency and queue information from the network. And this allows us to um, fine tune the sending rate so that we won't cause congestion. So that is one use case for um, current telemetry. Another use case is I want to, uh, this, there can be many different paths in which I can get from a source to a destination. And I want to answer queries like uh, where, which path did my packet stay or uh, what uh, forwarding rules did my packet follow. Um, in a more high level, if I'm an operator, I want to ask, does the path conform with my policy? For example, maybe I want the packet to go through a firewall or something like that. A third use case for telemetry is about network debugging. So if we have some poor performance somewhere, uh, maybe packet drops or high latency, uh, we need to diagnose that, but networks are quite complex. So in this case, we can ask, uh, what are the links of switches that have high latency? Or maybe identify load imbalance if there are uh, two ways to go to the same location. Maybe one of them is congested while the other is not. And this is all done using uh, telemetry. And before we're going to go into our solution, let me tell you a bit about the current standard for telemetry. It's called INT, or in-band network telemetry. And the idea is conceptually simple. So if we want to collect information, let's say I want to figure out the path, I can just add it to the packets. So in INT, the first hop on the path, it's called the INT store. It installs a new header, it's called the INT header, that tells all of the hops on the path what type of information we are trying to collect, like maybe we're collecting switches. And then uh, the INT source can add its own information, like its own switch ID, and send it. The next hop reads the INT header, figures we're collecting switch IDs, add its own switch ID, and send it to the next hop, and so on. So this is how uh, the packet goes all the way to the last hop, which is the INT sync. The INT sync removes uh, the INT information from the packet, so this entire uh, protocol is transparent to the sender and receiver. And now that we have this information, we know the path, we can send it to processing um, in Cheeto. So INT is really general. Uh, you can use it not just for switch IDs, you can use it uh, to collect latency measurements, buffer measurements, and a few others. Um, it's already running in production in companies like Alibaba. Uh, but it is also expensive. So any type of information you want to collect using INT would add more and more information on each hop on the fan. And something that is hard coded in the INT standard is that each type would add four bytes per hop. So if you want switch ID, that's four bytes, latency four bytes, and so on. And the reason why we care about this is that this adds up. So if we have even a short path of five hops, uh, the overall overhead would be uh, 28 bytes. So we have four bytes per hop and another eight bytes for the uh, INT header. So we ran an experiment in which we add this overhead. So the X axis here corresponds to adding uh, one information type, two information type up to five. So like maybe one is just which AD, two is which AD and latency and so on. And the Y axis, is some metric of the performance of the network, um, which is how we degrade the, the good put uh, compared to no overhead. And what we saw is that even for these short passes, even for one information type, this already reduces the performance quite a bit. And this gave us the motivation for PI, which is probabilistic INT. And the goal is to uh, minimize the overhead while collecting telemetry. In PI, we have something we call values. And the idea is that whenever a packet gets to a switch, we observe some value. So these values can be um, one of the INT information types, but it can also be some function of them or really any quantity that is computable on the data plane of switch. And our insights in Pine, the reason why we think we can improve over INT is that most applications don't really need all of the information that INT collects, so all of these uh, per packet per switch values. Uh, they care about some aggregate form of them. And if we can run the aggregation on in, inside of the network, we can reduce the overhead quite a bit. 
And this is a joint work with other from Harvard and with uh, Gianni and Pichi from uh, Queen Mary University in London. So let me explain about the type of aggregation we can do in Pine. Uh, the first is what's called per packet aggregation. The idea is that the packet is going to go through a path. It is going to observe some value on each path, like maybe the latency. And then we want to aggregate these values, so compute some function of this sequence of values, like maybe compute the maximal latency. Another type of aggregation is what we call per flow. So a flow is a connection, it has multiple packets, and each of them is gonna go through and see some value on each switch. And we have two subcases. The first is the static case where the values are the same uh, across the different packets, and maybe the switch ID or something. Uh, and we want to read the values, like figure out the path taken by this flow. Um, and the last case is the dynamic case, the most challenging one where the values can be different, like maybe these are latency measurements. Uh, so they're different for each uh, packet and switch pair. And we still want to aggregate them somehow. For example, maybe we want to compute the median latency or tail latency of that flow on that switch. Let's go back to our use cases. So for congestion control, the current state of the art is using INP to collect several types of information. And this allows them to tune the sending rate. But if you look at the formula that uh, the system is using to determine the sending rate, it actually only cares about the bottleneck and the network on, on the path. And this means that if we can compute the formula on the switches instead of at the end of host, we can track just the maximum, which corresponds to the bottleneck. So what we did for uh, congestion control is that we slightly modified the formula so that the switches would be able to compute it. And then we can track the maximum or some approximation of the maximum uh, on the packet. And what we saw is that even though we are now using a tiny fraction of the overhead that HPCC is using, that uh, the state of the art is using, we already get comparable performance for uh, short flows and we can actually improve the performance for long flows. And the reason for this is that if we have a lower overhead for the telemetry, we can send more data in each packet. And this means we send fewer packets and uh, we have a speed up from that. The second use case was path profiling. Uh, so the values here are just the switch idea. I want to figure out what is the path taken by a flow. And in our paper, we have a solution that allows us to do that with any overhead, like even one bit. Uh, but let me explain how to do that if we are willing to write one identifier on each packet. Right, so if we're able to write one identifier on each packet, uh, one way uh, to solve this problem is to write one sample identifier on each packet. And this was proposed before. Um, so uh, we can actually use the time to live field on the packet header. So this is like a counter that is decremented by one at each hop. And uh, we can use that to figure out what is our current hop numbers. Like we would know it is the second hop. And this allows us to implement an uh, algorithm uh, called the VAR sampling that makes sure that every hop is sampled with the same probability, like one in four in this example. So every packet would carry uh, some identifier. And once we collect enough identifiers, uh, we can see all of the different identifiers on the path. And we are done. We can now um, get the actual path. So uh, the way we measure how good an algorithm is for uh, path profiling or the static case in, the ge in uh, general is by how many packets we need before we can read out the values. And for this algorithm, it turns out this is called the coupon collector process. We have a K hop, if we have K hops or a, a K coupons on the path, then we will need something like a K lang K packets to figure out the entire path. So this is what we're going to try to improve here. Let me give you some uh, intuition as to where we think we can improve. So this is uh, the coupon collector algorithm, this algorithm I just told you about. Um, the x-axis here is the number of samples we collect. And the y-axis is the expected number of missing half, how many identifiers we don't know yet. And what we can see is that on the first, let's say, uh, 40 packets, we can actually collect uh, 20 out of the 25 hops in this example um, and figure out almost all of the path. But what happens now is that the probability of hitting new information with each consecutive packet is going to be at most one in five. 
So the algorithm really slows down and it takes a while before it completes the execution. So this is gonna be what we're gonna target, is this tail uh, that slows down the algorithm. And the way we're gonna do that, I'm gonna give you another algorithm that actually have similar performance to the baseline, but then I'll show you how the combination of the two gives us something useful. And this algorithm also makes a couple of assumptions that the previous algorithm didn't need. The first is that we know some typical path length, and the way to interpret that is that if the typical length is 10, then the passes in the network can be uh, three halves or 30 halves. They shouldn't be 10,000 halves. So this should be up to a small constant factor away from the actual pass length. And we're also going to assume that each packet have a unique identifier across the network. So the way this algorithm works is that each switch for each packet, it would XOR its identifier with some probability it is a function of this typical length. And the only tricky part about this algorithm is that we're going to do this not uh, by drawing random bits at the switches or making more bits at the switches, but according to some global hash function that depends on the time to leave field and the packet identifier. And the idea is that if we get a packet and it was XOR'd by A and B, uh, we can also compute this hash function H for the previous TTL value and figure out it was XOR'd by the first and second half. So this is how the algorithm proceeds. Maybe on the next packet, only C XOR'd it. Maybe got unlucky on the third packet and no one XOR'd it and so on. And the way we make progress in this algorithm is if we look, for example, at the last packet in this example, we can actually use it to infer um, the identifier of the fourth half because we already know that the identifier of the third half was C. Um, so if we go back to this figure, and this is just an intuition, this is not an actual algorithm, but let's say that after 40 packets, I'm somehow able to uh, change from the coupon collector process to the XOR algorithm, uh, and, I'm and I'm setting the um, XOR probability not to be one over 25 or one of the original passing, but to be one over five, one over the expected number of missed halves. Then what happens is that we actually have a higher chance of hitting new information with each packet, and this accelerates uh, the algorithm. But there's no need to stop here, because if you look at this new curve, it kind of looks like the previous one, it starts fast and then slows down. So we can switch to yet another XOR instance with an even higher XOR probability and get a larger speed up. So that was just intuition. Let me give you the actual algorithm. So this is done for every switch and each packet in the network. So with some probability, we're going to run this coupon collector algorithm that we started with. And otherwise, we're going to uh, select one of several XOR algorithms at random. And the XOR algorithms are different from each other uh, in their um, sampling probability, the probabilities for XOR. So what it turns out is that if we optimize the parameters here, we can actually bring down the number of packets we need to uh, discover the path from K and K to something that is nearly linear in K. And this is what it looks like. So this figure here, you have on the X axis, the uh, number of packets that we collected, and the Y axis is the uh, decoding probability. So we can see that the baseline and XO have roughly the same performance, but uh, using the combination of the two, uh, we can not only um, decrease the number of packets we need on average, so if we have a much sharper tail bound, so if you want to decode 99% of the flows, it would require uh, much fewer packets. So what else do we have in the paper? We have algorithm for dynamic aggregation. We have uh, performance guarantees for our algorithms. And we also have support for concurrent queries. And what I mean by that is we can actually run all of these three uh, use cases I told you about at the same time and using just 16 bits per packet. So this is like a minimal amount of overhead per packet and still, um, have a performance that is not much worse than running each of them separately. So we can pack all of these together. Okay, so in today's talk, I uh, explained how to leverage programmable uh, hardware to do some cool stuff, but I also worked on other approaches uh, to address the challenges. Uh, one approach that was the purpose of my PhD was on approximation algorithms. And like in other domains in computer science, it allows us to get solutions that are uh, faster and more memory efficient. 
this allows to fit the data structure into the Haslam of a uh, uh, hardware uh, switch or the cache of a CPU. I worked on redesigning algorithms for speed. And what I mean by that is that if we want to push the limit of what we can do in software, um, then we really need to optimize for speed and not memory, which was the uh, usual metric for streaming algorithms. And for example, this allows us to meet the line rate when doing the measurement of software switch. And finally, I've been working on designing expressive measurement algorithms. And what I mean by that is I want one data structure that supports many different queries and not run a separate algorithm for each. Okay, so let me summarize uh, by telling you some thoughts about the future. So one thing is, I think a lot of people today are still uh, working um, mostly on CPU. So if you're an algorithm person, and then you're probably um, mostly working on RAM machines and things like that. And I think there are many interesting uh, opportunities in this new hardware architecture. So for me, uh, what I find interesting here and important is to design a new uh, theoretical model that captures what these switches can do and what are the costs of uh, these switches. And the idea is that I want to make them more accessible uh, to the theory community and the algorithm community. Um, I think we should find the right balance between hardware and software. And we touched it a little bit in Cheetah, but the way we uh, break down queries into uh, hardware and software should be done in a more principled way. And I think there are a lot of me here uh, to figure out what is the right way to do that. And finally, I think we should co-design uh, hardware with the software and algorithm. And what I mean by that is that in today's talk, um, we took a pizza switch out of the box and worked around this constraint um, to make something useful. Um, but we actually see that some of the capabilities that we're missing on the switch because it doesn't support them uh, can actually boost our performance a lot. Uh, so it makes more sense to me in the future to work with switch vendors and try to push, for example, um, for inclusion of uh, pairwise independent hashing on the switches that are currently not supported, this small switch, um, because we see that this uh, has the performance of the algorithm a lot. Okay, and with that, I'll be happy to uh, take any questions. Um, Oh, great, thank you. I, I don't know if there's a good way to applause uh, <laughs> on, on Zoom. Um, I, will, um, I will open it up for, I know we're kind of running a bit out of time, but we have two or three minutes. Um, if anybody in the audience um, has a question, just, just speak. Yeah, you don't need to type it. I, I have a question. Um, yeah. But this, this goes back to Cheetah. I was just curious. Are you assuming for, for um, functions like this in the switch that, the, that there's um, a cluster, which means you know, a, a set of nodes and a set of switches that are running a single application, such as Spark? So yeah, so the way we view Cheetah is that uh, you want to run some query, uh, then you can use the switch as a hardware accelerator. But what we can actually do is we can pack um, the data structure for many queries on the switch simultaneously. So we can split the resources of the switch. So this way, if you want to run um, multiple queries uh, that don't touch the same uh, set of resources, you can do that. So we distinguish the different queries using different ports. Um, so that is possible. But the downside of it is that now you have to partition your resources, so you may get uh, less pruning for each of the uh, yeah. queries. Um, but what we saw is that if you can prune, let's say, 90% of the uh, data, so for most queries, uh, this completely removes the uh, computation bottleneck. So you don't actually need a lot of resources for each specific query to get high speed up. And at this point, this becomes about increasing the uh, network rate to get larger speed up. And we do see that. So we have some experiments in which we run the best network, and we see an even higher speed up compared to the graphs I showed you. I'm really wondering about multiplexing really different applications. You know, I'm running um, 
ticket master and I'm running a web, you know, a generic web server and I'm running Spark and I'm running something else. Suddenly the switch becomes a general purpose computer and then that doesn't work anymore. So that means that to me simply that you have to um, have separate um, physical uh, clusters for each of those applications if you're going to use this. Maybe not, but that was it. So, so I said, like, if, if you can partition the switches also between the different applications that you're going to run simultaneously, and you distinguish the applications uh, using, let's say, a port number on the packet so that the switch would know uh, how to associate each packet with the relevant application, then you can run them simultaneously. You don't need uh, more than one switch for that. Okay. I'll stay. I had a question. So um, uh, the uh, I, I thought the XOR technique was really interesting, and um, uh, but it seems like the applicability of that is primarily to uh, what you call static uh, data. Can you comment on? Uh, are there any uh, kind of uh, similarly cool things that you can do when you have dynamic data that you want, that you that you want to collect? Uh, yeah, so for dynamic data, this definitely doesn't work. You cannot XOR things that are changing packet over packet. Um, so what we do for dynamic packet, uh, for dynamic uh, values is we run something like a distributed sampling process from the switches so we can get uh, some values from each switch. But we also um, compress the values so that we don't have to write an entire value on uh, each packet. And what we show is that even if we have just, let's say, four bits per packet to run this, uh, we can still estimate uh, quantiles and uh, find frequent values and uh, several other um, aggregations uh, pretty efficiently. Got it. Cool. Thanks. Uh, cool. Um, if there are no other questions, I will call the meeting to a close. Okay, I'm going once, twice. All right. Okay. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Yay. Thank uh, you. <laughs> All right.